Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is Thursday, October 19th, and this episode is brought to you by my fantastic motorcycle sponsor, El Cajon Harley. Two-wheel masters. You need to get a motorcycle. Do not sleep. Go down to my boys, El Cajon Harley, down there in Southern California. I don't care where you live. Get on an airplane, fly into San Diego. My boy Greg Riley will pick you up. You can buy your dream motorcycle and ride it home to wherever you're at. They got an excellent uh, selection of all the 2018s right now on the floor. You can go on their website and apply to be pre-approved right away, right on their website, elcajonharley.com. And uh, also you can see their incredible inventory. They got a great pre-owned inventory and brand new. They've got a lot of amazing machines in there. They've got the CVO Ultra. That's the one I want. The Grandpa Machine. Uh, go check them out, man. Get yourself down to El Cajon Harley. Get yourself two wheels. You know you always wanted two wheels. What are you doing? Don't sleep. El Cajon Harley. Your one-stop motorcycle shop hit him up see my boy greg follow him on twitter and instagram and facebook also give him a call 619-444-1123 how are you guys here we are thursday episode with a great guest today i've been uh been loving interviewing some of my favorite rock photographers and today the grand poobah the king the master the high water mark of rock and roll photography, Mr. Neil Preston, is my guest today. And uh, if you don't know him, press, uh, press pause real quick and go look at his photos. My God, they are jaw dropping. He shot the rock stars when there was rock stars. It's going to be funny. They're probably. There's going to be rock photography forever as long as there's live music, but there's not going to be these icons, man. Even the bands I love, they're never going to reach the level of what some of these people did that Neil shot. Neil was a personal photographer, the tour photographer for Led Zeppelin from 75 to 79. He is the only man I have ever met that rode in the... Led Zeppelin private jet, the fucking massive plane, the starship, and later on, the Caesar's chariot. We talk all about that. Can you imagine just being part of the, the guys, you know, part of the crew on Zeppelin's tour in 77? I mean, that was the behemoth. Or how about being part of uh, Bruce Springsteen's uh, crew on the Born in the USA tour? Or Queen, shooting Queen at Wembley at, at, at Live Aid. Well, I mean, what about that? Some of the biggest ever. I mean, this man was back there. Uh, you know, and he saw shit. He saw shit. It's a lot like going to war, man. You, you, you come home alive and some stuff you don't talk about and other stuff you do. And uh, this man has great stories. His photos have been my favorite all my life. He shot a photo of Robert Plant at Kezar Stadium in San Francisco, I believe on the 75 tour outdoor show when a dove just flew into Robert's hand. He's got a Newcastle beer and a cigarette in his hand. Those photos, man. I mean, he, he shot a photo that is Springsteen at Wembley that is one of the most rocking photos ever during the uh, Born, Born in the USA tour. His Queen shots, his Randy Rhodes shots, his everybody, his Fleetwood Mac, his Axl Rose, his Freddie Mercury's will punch you in the face. They're so good. And the photos that he took aren't just your standard. That's the thing. A lot of people hit me with rock photography. They're like, it's like rock bands. They're like, oh, well, if you like rock photography, you'll love this guy. And you look at it and you go, yeah, yeah, he shot some bands. 
but he didn't capture anything. What's there? With Neil, when you look at his photos, you feel like you're at the concert, man. It's like a time machine. I'm just sitting there with my jaw down like, wow, look at this photo. So yeah, great, great guest today. And uh, he's got an incredible book out. We talk all about the book and, and many other stories. And it was great to have him on. I tried to get him on for over a year and it finally happened. So right on. Another, another notch on my belt for dream guests. Where are you at, Henry Rollins? Where are you at, Sean Penn? Where are you at, Matt Dillon? <laughs> Shouting out dream guests like they listen. You know who you are, Robert Plant. You don't go to Stern. You come over here. This is the interview in my apartment in Studio City. That's the one you want to do. <laughs> anyway. Feeling good today about to take off to Austin. I'm going to be in Austin tomorrow with Bill Burr. Uh, I cannot wait to do the iconic um, Austin City Limits room. I am fucking fired up, man. I'll be there Friday and Saturday. I believe it's three shows. Come see Bill Burr and myself with some candles lit. Uh, shout out to Greg. No, no uh, last name, but Greg made a donation on Patreon. You want to donate to this podcast, it helps. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Which, by the way, I wanted to get into something before I do start the episode up. I want to get into something a little bit serious. Recently, uh, I'm not going to get into all the, uh, the, um, the intricate, uh, you know, specifics of podcasting and numbers and, uh, and all that. But recently, um, the hosting company that I use, Libsyn, has changed the way they count uh, numbers on this podcast. So I found it interesting. It was, it's, it's like algorithms is always going to be a hocus pocus to me. I'm never going to understand it. It just seems uh, kind of... Uh, uh, delusional or illusional, both of them. They'll be delusional because you'll be like, whoa, I'm number 20. And then you're like, how did I get there? Is it an illusion? Anyway, the bottom line is it all comes down to do you subscribe to the podcast? That's how we get it in the top 200. It, I guess it goes on new subscribers every seven days. So if you listen to this, and even if you're a part-time listener or whatever, subscribe. Subscribe to this podcast. Tell your friends to subscribe and tell everybody, man, I'm busting my ass out here. I want to get the show bigger so I can go out to other cities and do comedy and, uh, and, and spread the word, you know? So... Uh, all real there. Subscribe to the podcast. I love you guys. Uh, some shows coming up before I cut out of here. This weekend, like I said, Austin City Limits. Then um, I'm going to be in uh, Iowa with Bill Burr at the Surf Ballroom on November 2nd. I will also be at... Uh, Sacramento Punchline, December 7, 8, 9 with Joey Diaz. Better get the tickets for that pretty quick. That shit will sell out. Um, 7, 8, 9. And uh, that's about it right now as far as upcoming shows, I believe. Yeah, man. Let's keep the candles lit. Thank you for all your love and support. Spread the word. Let's get it going. Here he is, Neil Preston. We are on the record. We are on the record. Neil Preston, how are you, buddy? I'm okay. Um, uh, it's, it's been a whirlwind. Um, it's a little warm outside for this time of year, but uh, it's all good, man. It's all good. I can't believe that the time has come. Yeah. How long have I been trying to get you on? Like a year? Uh, a, a while. Yeah. Who's, who's counting, you know? <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you, the day that... Uh, the day this book, my the only copy that I have in my possession, the day it showed up by FedEx, I just stared at the envelope. Yeah, yeah. For about a day because 
obviously I knew what was inside, but you know, there's a little bit of butterflies. Uh, what's you know, what's it really gonna look like? And and it's the sum total of. Well, I like to say it took two years to uh, to put together, but it really took forty eight years. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. I mean, you're. Uh, I've I've had many photographers on here, uh, and I usually choose them for a. a a section of body of work that has blown my mind, like mm -hmm. Baron Woolman, his Dan the Green sure, photos. Sure. Uh, Mark Weiss uh, for the early GNR at the Ritz, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, I'm an absolute Zeppelin freak. My life is Zeppelin up until about two years ago. It's become Grateful right. Dead. But my life is Zeppelin. Oh, you're a deadhead? Now I am. See you later, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm nothing if, if I'm not honest. So. Well, I hated the dead growing up. You know what I mean? I grew yeah. up in San Francisco Bay Area. Right, Everything right. was the dead. And then Metallica came, and I was yeah, like, finally, yeah, a band yeah, for yeah. me, you know? But it was really Zeppelin... And uh, the obsession of everything about Zeppelin and my first real um, turn on to you is one of the probably the greatest Zeppelin photos of all time. And it's the Kizar Stadium, uh, Robert Plant yeah. with the dove in the hand right. and the Newcastle beer and the cigarette. Right, right. I saw that photo because I lived a block from Kizar oh, when yeah? it used to be there. Yeah. And the first time I saw that photo, everything about that photo to me is, look, I got goosebumps right now because it... It really is the definition of rock and roll to me. Everything right there in that one yeah. photo. It's Bill Graham. It's right, San right. Francisco. It's an early kind of version of a day on the green. Not quite. Yeah, well, it was, it was an afternoon outdoor gig. Right. Which uh, that alone made it kind of out of the ordinary. Yeah, exactly. Because back then... To see your idols, that's what was so weird about Dan the Green, to see him in no. the daytime. It's so unusual. Yeah, yeah. And to see great photos of the daytime without the rock and roll lighting and the smoke yeah, and yeah, everything, right, right. it's really the most purest form of who that yeah, person it's, it's is. A it's a whole different atmosphere. And um, even if you're outdoors, uh, an outdoor gig, which... The opening acts are playing in daylight, but you know the closing act always waits for the sun to start going down. Even even those gigs feel different. Even the the nighttime outdoor gigs, right? But certainly the daylight ones are are feel different, look different, and as a photographer, they're fantastic to to work at. Yeah. You know? Now, some of your Zeppelin photos, I mean, the, the number two most iconic one for me, of course, is, is Jimmy Page with the Jack Daniels bottle, Madison Square Garden. Everybody, no, that's actually Indianapolis. Oh, Indianapolis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody knows those two photos, right, right. inside and out, man. I mean, right. and what I see from those, most of all, is one of the things I love about Zeppelin the most, and we'll get into it with this Nebworth mm. photo, is the greatest manager of all time, Peter Graham. Hands Amen. down. Amen. Amen. Hands down. And what I see is once I see the access that you have, then I know this guy's a special person because Peter Grant was Fort Knox. And you can see it in yeah, the song yeah. Remains the Same yeah. when he's like, you cunts are selling posters, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, and, uh, I, I was not there uh, when they filmed that scene, but that is that is not anything that Peter, knowing Peter as I did, I don't think that's anything that he was playing to the cameras about. I mean, right. that was Peter. And um, there's no question that he held the king, the keys to the kingdom, you know, w without question. And I'm the only person that was ever hired to actually be their tour photographer and go on the road with them for extended periods. It's not like they didn't hire a photographer here or there. But it, it was an anomaly for, for, for them to hire someone to be their guy. Right. Uh, tour after tour. I mean, a little bit at the end of 73, but it's all 75 and 77 yeah. in the U.S. And then Nebworth in 79. And, uh, you know, how the... F I don't know if I can say... Oh, you can say anything you want, man. How the fuck did that happen? Yeah. <coughs> how uh, did the fuck that well, happen? Well, well... It happened as as it turned out. Um, well, I'll tell you the story. I had after I moved to LA in 1971 
from any, New York. From New York, after I, a year after I graduated high school. Any women listening? It was really 1991. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I had moved out to L.A. And, and hooked up with another photographer, Andy Kent. Uh, we had a partnership, and, and we had negotiated a little um, retainer deal with Atlantic Records. And the deal was very simple. We got paid a certain amount of money a, a month. It w- certainly wasn't a lot of money. But uh, the, the, the parameters were pretty much that one of us had to always be in town and available for Atlantic, mostly to either shoot some of their bands who were in town playing, uh, and a lot of it was to do what we would call trade shots, which are go up to the office, give, give band A number 206 their gold records, shoot them with... The executives, you know, the gold record gotcha. shots, trade shots that would be given to Billboard, right. oh, Cashbox, yeah. and Record. Well, the big three then were Billboard, Cashbox, and Record World. So um, I had uh, one of the people that I happened to know even before I moved to New York, because um, I started shooting when I was in high school, Right, was Danny Goldberg. Now, Danny, who had become Led Zeppelin's PR guy, in I think seventy three, uh, when I met Danny, he was a writer. He was a rock critic for a magazine called Hullabaloo, which then became Circus Magazine. Oh wow! Great. So I knew Danny when I was sixteen or seventeen years old. Um, fast forwarding again to seventy three ish, Danny was their PR person. Uh, Atlantic had me go up to San Francisco. I think I shot San Diego, a couple of other things, but uh, I I wasn't uh, part of the band's crew or anything. Uh, in '74, I believe. If uh, I mean, I know there's someone out there who's going to bust me if I get the dates wrong. But yeah, I know. I always best, think that's to the a- best of my knowledge, as you would say, of the FBI. '74, um, they they launched Swan Song, their record label, and they had a launch party in New York and a launch party in LA. And I went and shot the launch party uh, for them, for Atlantic and for the band uh, at, at the LA party, which was held at the Bel Air Hotel. At some point that night, I said to Danny, who I had known for five years at this point, I said, uh, listen, I, I know you guys are, or rumor has it you guys are going out on the road early 75 if you want to consider hiring a tour photographer, consider my hat, you know, firmly thrown into the, into the ring. And, uh, cause you're a huge fan or are you looking for work? Because I wanted to work for Led Zeppelin. Right. I mean, I was a fan. I right. was a fan of a lot of bands, but look, when you have Led Zeppelin on your resume, it does not hurt. No, in no, any way, the biggest at the form. time. Exactly. And, uh, but I just thought, you know, I knew that they had never had a tour photographer, and that's what I started doing a lot of. And I, and Danny knew my work, and and I think Jimmy had seen a couple of my photos from '73 that he liked, and I I had met P- Peter briefly, and uh, kind of dropped it there. And a, a couple of months later, this must have been about October, November of '74. Uh, the phone rang in the office and uh, I picked it up. It was Danny and he said, you know, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Small talk. Remember what you said about wanting to come out on the road with us in 75? I said, yeah. He said, if you're still up for it, we'd like to hire you. I said, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you didn't even ask him the money or anything, right? No. Yeah. No, because it's uh, m- money is it's, it might sound stupid, but money is not an issue uh when you're well, it's a little different when you're starting out than when you're established, but obviously I was going to get paid something. Yeah. And uh, and you don't even care. You're like I, I'm I going with Zeppelin. We didn't have parameters of a deal, but but uh, you know, he wanted to hire me and I didn't know until years later, maybe 5 years ago. Uh, Danny told me kind of the inside story of of how it happened. Uh, Zeppelin was notorious for 
being a very cloistered bunch, to yeah. say the least, being f pretty much anti-press. Yep. Certainly in this country because of the whole uh, thing with Jan Winter and Rolling Stone and the, yeah, bad, the reviews. bad reviews. I mean, scathing reviews. And so uh, the band didn't trust Rolling Stone. Uh, they only had a couple of what I'd say friends in in the media, and Cameron had done a story on the band in '73. Cameron for Crow for the LA Times, right? Um, so uh, they had warmed up to Cameron, and and it was decided that Zeppelin, and and this was this is from the band, from this from probably I don't know for a fact, but I suspect directly from Jimmy and Robert and Peter. Uh, they were the biggest and baddest band in the land by far, yet the Rolling Stones are getting all the press. The right. Rolling Stones are having, you know, movie stars come and visit them, and and this one and that one. And Zeppelin is, sorry, Mick Jagger, but Zeppelin is the biggest and baddest, and they have the swagger. And swagger is really a word that describes a lot about Led Zeppelin. So, um, so it was decided that if they were going to they wanted to do some more press than they had done previously. And of course they rarely did TV. No, they didn't do the any TV ever. Well, they that did was, in the very, 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 yeah, very right. Beginning. Very beginning. The France so, stuff. So, That's what I love about Peter Grant. He was like, if you want to see this band, you got to fucking gotta, pay and yeah, see them. Yeah. You got to come and see them. I love that. And thing. I remember, I remember they used to take out like one ad yeah. in a newspaper. So at any rate, so the idea was we're going to, we're going to do some interviews, but we need, current pictures to give to magazines for covers or whatever and and it uh cameron was one of the first people that came out on the road with us uh for, for the rolling stone cover and the rolling stone cover was obviously a big big deal because the band was very down on rolling stone and and was reticent to do to do it but they liked Cameron and Cameron knew his stuff and and regardless of if he was a fan or not the, the you know the, the people can tell i think you know artists can tell when a when a writer or a photographer uh if it's in their dna you know the fabric of what they're made made up of and yeah they're not a corporate dude right. and cameron talks about a little bit about it in in the intro that he wrote for my book which by the way makes me cry like a baby every time i read it uh so so danny said so that so we wanted to to we needed someone to have current pictures and someone who could mesh with the band and be visible yet invisible and and peter just peter who had a real street smarts sixth sense about him just trusted me for, and liked me from the get-go and so i got the gig and danny told me years later he said there is no question you were going to get the gig because all the other rock and roll photographers we knew were out of their minds oh, so, oh. you know you mean not maybe like, he didn't know me that well, right? Right. But, um, it, but it, it, you know, and he said, "Yeah, look, you're close to their age, and and it just all made sense." Yeah, and that's how I got the job. Once you're up and running, uh, seventy five, they've got the jet by then, right? They've well, they had the Starship in seventy three and seventy five. I believe. right seventy five. We had the Starship. Yeah, so, seventy seven. We had the Caesars Chariot. 77 that's this one here yeah, right that, yeah which by the way uh i have never seen this fucking photo and when i saw it today i lost my mind well it's you know and, the, and that plane yeah well i don't know how, how much you know about these planes but the starship that that was the one with the brown it had brown the starship I don't remember yep. the outside i mean how, yeah yeah but, yeah uh, yeah but uh, lots but of drugs starship, on there <laughs> i'm not gonna say that uh <laughs> we'll, we'll get we'll get to that because yeah. I have I have a very honest answer for that. Yeah, because I had Mick Rock on, and boy, did that guy party! Oh, I partied. But yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get to this. I get you. Uh, but as far as the planes are concerned, the Starship was, I believe, owned by a guy named Ward Carlisle, who was Bobby Sherman's manager, I believe. Wow. Anyway, I, th I think Bobby Sherman was one of the co-owners of the of the Starship. And, uh, you know, it had been used by, I believe, Elvis. Right. Elton John, Deep Purple. Um, 
the almonds might have used it a little while. Um, I said Elton. Uh, I know I'm leaving some other major band out. But, the, you know, the Starship was the top of the mountain for airplanes. and uh, It was just a guy's plane, and then people would la- la- labeled yeah. it up their own way? Well, it was gutted and reconfigured. Each and, time for each band? Um, not each time. Not that I, I don't know. I, I could put you in touch with the guy who, who would know about that, who, uh, a dear friend of mine, David Bernstein, who now charters planes for every band in the world. And wow, that'd own, be amazing. Owns Rocket Cargo. Oh yeah, but, but I'd the, love to talk to him. The, the, but the guy who who was in charge of chartering the Starship, I I, I I can't recall his name. Is that the one that had the fireplace in it and shit? Looked like a fireplace. Um, I don't recall there being a fireplace. In How about it, a but, piano? Well, oh yeah, it had a it had a keyboard and a mirrored bar and yeah, and, you know, I mean, it was it was gaudy, but but it got it got us where we were going, and in seventy seven. I guess the Starship had been decommissioned or something. Right. So they got the Caesars Palace chariot, and that was a plane that Caesars Palace used to use to fly their high rollers in from all over the country. Wow. So how we got it for a month and a half, I, I don't know. Maybe it was a slow month at the at the gaming tables. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, both planes were were fantastic, and and I'd like to say that that. You you, well, you never get tired of traveling on a place like that. Yeah, because you're the only like guy that. I know that's been on this plane, which blows my mind. Well, because I mean, a lot of bands had their own planes. I know, but this is like at the time, the photos. There's the photo of them on the tarmac, and they're there, and the planes behind them. You know right, what well, I mean? That that picture I didn't shoot. I know. I'm just right, saying. Right, right, yeah. Though, when you see that photo. You look at it as like, holy shit, this is some next. Yeah, Yeah. it's a jet, and it's next level. This is a next, and you see all the photos of them on the couches, drinking and partying. Yeah, and the the, the bar, and, and, you know, I didn't really venture into the back too often because that was kind of Jimmy's and Peter's realm. But, uh, uh, you, you know, I love to fly, and I've taken flying lessons. I never got certified, but... But I'll go up in two ice cream cone sticks with, with a rubber band. Yeah. Uh, so I've been on the big planes, the medium-sized planes, the prop jets, the, the, the four-seaters. Yeah. You name it, I've been on it. The helicopters, all kinds of helicopters. And, uh, the, the, you know, w- when you have a plane like this, or any plane that'll fit the band and the entourage. Yeah. And we had a very small entourage. It was small, always with Zeppelin? Oh, yeah. I mean, four band members, some security guys, Peter, Richard Cole, photographer, me, a couple of the people that that, uh, worked for Swan Song in New York. And that was it, I think. Then the the rest was in buses and trucks. The rest were were doing... I mean, once in a while, there would be... One of the roadies would, would be with us, but... It was, I mean, a small, small, and as I said, cloistered bunch. I mean, the Rolling Stones, even then, God knows now, they have a guy who serves Mick Jagger his tea, and then there's a guy who brings the cups to the guy who serves Mick his tea. (laughs) Then there's the guy who's told to go to the store to buy the right tea to give to the guy who has the cups to give to the guy who gives me the tea. <laughs> I love how you, know you jab at the stones. And before you know it, yeah. you, you know, you've got 300 people on the road with you. That's what they had, 350 on outdoor, yeah, 300 yeah, on yeah, indoor. Exactly, and they, and they had A and B. Yep. So, so while they're on stage A, exactly. B is rolling Being over to Tulsa. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we, you know, a promoter was usually with us, be it, uh, not, it uh, 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 Tom Hewlett. Yep, the but, guy doing the whole tour. Yeah, the promoter, um, and uh, and then um, oh god, what the, the other guys? Jeez, uh, I'm having a brain fart here. But uh, point is, maybe, maybe twelve, thirteen, fourteen people. Wow, maybe. Yeah, if there was the odd journalist on, you know, certainly not more than fifteen. I mean that, that that's 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 one room that's one room on a Rolling Stones tour. Yeah, yeah. So you, now you get out there in 75 immediately and your mind's got to be blown. You're on like a Zeppelin tour, you know? And that's the weird tour where Jimmy had the broke fingers, right? 
Well, he, he well no, he hurt his fingers at the end of seventy three. Right. And I it's funny because it's funny you mention that because I took a picture of him at the end of the show in San Diego and you can't quite I was a little tight, you can't quite see it, but he's holding his hand. Yeah. And it turned out he was in a lot of pain. And he's got this smile which is half smile, half grimace on his face. And he had seen that and and I think that was one of the pictures that sat in the back of his mind saying oh that's the guy that did that photo you know because it meant something more to him than just a photo of a guy at the end of a show right so um uh but you know i mean i'm 75 so dean it's a job yeah I mean, and i rarely did i approach any gig with anyone and my band is the who okay wow so, but rarely have I approached any any tour with anyone with with the back of my mind going, I can't believe I'm fucking doing this. You know, this yeah. Is so that's I can't do my job if I if I get into that headspace. Yeah, like when I was out with the Stones, you know, people don't understand. Like once you're out with it, you need to be in the headspace of I'm supposed to be here. Well, you're working. You're working, yeah, and right. also. At no time do you, um, there's a th an excerpt in your book here where you talk about the gamble of bringing someone backstage. Do oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Stuff you can <laughs> trade because there is, and people come up to you. I remember, you know, uh, I'd be on tour and a guy would be like, you work for the Stones? Dude, I work at Rolex. Anything you want, I'll trade yeah, exactly, you. Can you exactly. get me in? Yeah. And that stuff, if you did that, you'd be gone. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And, no, and no. you start to learn the parameters of rock and roll. And yes. that's why I've been able to be around people all my life because you're not like, oh, man, I'll do that outside right, of it. Right, like, right, holy right. shit. Well, there's there's a, a lot of what I wrote in my book is is well everything i wrote in my book is centered around and the, the whole point of the book was you think i have the dream job of the 20th 21st centuries not so fast buddy yeah. here's what really goes on so the stories i tell it, it's about my job here are the you know potholes in the road here are the pressures the stresses it's extremely stressful the 48-year case of constant jet lag, which has never dissipated, the deadlines, you know, there's so much stress and so much going on that, you know, I, I can't worry about how great the show is. You know, I got to worry about, you know, I got to sit down with Jimmy and look at pictures or I got to do this or I got to do that. And um, the the other stuff, and I talk a lot about why you don't bring her some super hot babe, you know, with a pocket full of blow or whatever. Why you don't just bring her backstage because when she invari invariably vomits on the bass player's shoes, yeah. it's my responsibility. Yep. Yeah. You know, and I, and I write, uh, besides stuff goes on back there. You don't want to know about, I mean, all the fans want to get backstage, but a lot of stuff goes on there that you don't want to know about. It's mostly business related. Right. The, the 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 artists don't really don't want to be bothered they wh wh whomever they are the different ones have different pre-show rituals but i you know as far as i'm concerned i say i write it's a hot zone back there it is think chernobyl with guitars it's true it's true <laughs> because what happens is and i've seen it many times even with some of my closest friends they're like dude can i go back there and and I usually say, eh, it's not good. Well, once in a while, you'll bring someone, and they'll keep their cool for about five minutes. Yeah, and then and all then, hell breaks loose. And then yeah. you turn yeah. your yeah. back for a minute to get something, and yeah. poof, they're on the guy. Like, yeah. Well, well, yeah, I mean, look, common sense. You figure out a lot of this go along the way with common sense. But uh, you, you, I, I, as I write in the book, and... and most of the stuff I'm going to talk about is in the book. So, but uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you're offered. And I've been offered merchandise, cash, dope, sex, you name it, to give to give someone a backstage pass. And uh, I'm not going to say I haven't turned down one or two of those things yeah, yeah, yeah. in the past. But but. It's it's a power that must be used for good, not for evil, and 
And Especially with a guy like Peter Grant. Especially with guys like Jimmy Page or Robert Plant or right. Bonzo. Bonzo. Or, you know, or any of them. Or What or, kind of guy was Bonzo? Bonzo was... Uh, was he trapped into that thing of people want to see Bonzo be Bonzo? Well, you know what? Interestingly enough, um, Bonzo was, was the, the guy in the band that I spent the least amount of time with one-on-one. Uh, but he could be incredibly genial and and gentlemanly, you know, an English gentleman. You know, I mean, these are farm guys. I, I think he, he and Robert grew up in the same town or same area outside, of, somewhere in, in England. And, uh, you know, he could be very well-mannered and just wonderful. However, there was... Uh, Another side that, uh, you know, all, all of us know people like this. You get enough booze in you and, you, you know, you become somebody else. Yep. So far be it from me to castigate anyone for, for their alcohol or drug intake or lack thereof. Um, but, you know, he could be a terror. I know other people, other other guys in other bands that could be just as much a, a terror. So, um, but you know, it's when the guy's on stage, that's what matters. Yeah, you know, and the guy could play like no other. And and it, interesting, it's interesting that I remember noticing at some point when I first started working for them was. <clears throat> Sorry, it was on the stage. It could go pretty much anywhere I wanted. I remember noticing that Jimmy and Bonzo had a, a very tight visual connection where Jimmy would play to Bonzo a lot. He would turn around and and move his head, and it wasn't that he was trying to get the... As far as I could tell, anyway, I'm not an expert, but it wasn't about trying to get the tempo up or down, but it was about leading him along... And I'll never forget that, that, you know, he didn't, I never noticed it with Jimmy and Jonesy, but I noticed it with Jimmy and Bonzo. Just ca- chemistry, too. Just, just, just. Back and forth. Boom. Yeah. You know, just staring at him and with big smile. And, you know, I read a quote somewhere that Jonesy had, had, had referred to Bonzo as someone who was fearless on stage, that he, he would do fills and things that you would think he would never get back to the proper time signature, and he always did. Yeah. He said Bonzo was fearless, and uh, and he was. When you're out there traveling with him and you're shooting these photos and stuff, and we got a little peek at the Peter Grant of like bootleggers and, and all that kind of stuff, and of course, uh, what's Richard Cole, that whole Dan the Green thing that goes yeah, I down. I wasn't there that day. I was, I was ill and couldn't. Wow, couldn't you didn't make. get to shoot that last one, it's huh? Just as well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you, go, you go five weeks with an average of. Uh, 97 minutes of sleep a night you know it catches up to you yeah yeah (laughs) but when you're out with them are you seeing a lot of the shady underbelly of what's going on out there of like scammers and fake passes and people sneaking in and bootleggers and all no more so than with any other band i mean I'm just asking you because I always thought that fucking Peter Grant was the ultimate genius, and I I dream of a manager like a Peter Grant in my career. uh, Because as I look at this photo of Nebworth, it's an aerial photo. And and you read the story. Yeah, and and it's one of the most incredible photos. Uh, First of all, I've had a lot of photographers on here, and, and I think that these photos probably fuck me up the most as far as like when i look are you at, scared of heights no 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 i'm saying when i look at them i i i could stare at them for hours like when i was at Marin's house and opened up it, i just flipped it open and it landed on the skinnered photo of them with the pv amps and everything it, it look at goosebumps again it just no. stops me in my tracks to see the beautiful Rock and roll is beautiful in so many ways to me. The outfits, the equipment, the hairdos, the vibe. The people. The, the people. Per, the personalities. You know, I talk about personalities, and I talk about the fact that rock tours 
have personalities over and above the personalities of the artists within the tour. Right. And 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 this is a very important point because the personality of a tour can flip on a dime due to bad audience, bad record review in the paper, drugs, unmanaged that's not so much that because th- that may be a constant, but you know the X factors. Drummer got the clap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, someone, sh- some, someone's wife showed up when they shouldn't have, and 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 I'm not talking about Led Zeppelin. I'm talking about any any band, any right? Tour. I get it. And um, y- you know, the, and someone's in a bad mood for whatever reason. A business thing didn't work out, and and that is something that really. A lot of people don't ever get to to find that out because uh, it's it, one it, night. It's to subtle. Them. It's, it's subtle. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. but 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 you know, some nights there are more tension. There's more tension around. I mean, yeah. I think I I wrote something that say, says that says. Blah, blah, blah. Let me start again. I th- I think I wrote something akin to, and I'm paraphrasing myself, but it's pretty close. There's more drama on one Rolling Stones tour than in ten Martin Scorsese films. That's true. That's and true. It, I write another piece about you are not a member of the band. Exactly. And you cannot act like you're a member of the band. Exactly. Um, you know, we did this little promo video, a four minute video, if you've seen it. But uh, there's a piece that, that Brian May talks about. And he was very sweet and over complimentary. And he and he said, you know, Neil spent a lot of time with us. And he said there are many times that Neil was the fifth member of Queen, which I laugh at because I like to say, yeah, I'm the one without the humongous bank account. <laughs> but but um, you know, the irony of all of that is, the more visible I am, yeah, the more invisible I become. Yeah, but that's very ironic. And. Um, you just get to, uh, you know, you cannot act. Uh, what's what would be the word? Um, you know, you you cannot act like you are entitled, uh, like you have a sense of entitlement because you're working f- with Queen, right, or Fleetwood Mac, or Led Zeppelin, or the Who, or any of them. Because you'll sure, be gone sure, in a minute. Sure as hell, there's going to be something slipped under your door one night, and it ain't going to be the rooming list for tomorrow. It's going to be a one way ticket home. Exactly. I've seen it go down with dudes. Oh, yeah. I've yeah, seen yeah. dudes fucking around, yeah. and then you're like, hey, where's Billy at? And they go, oh. oh yeah. And well, then everybody's yeah, yeah, laughing. Yeah, exactly. Oh, he got the one way ticket last yeah, night. Yeah. And, um, and so you, you, know, you are not a member of the band. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm friends with many of them. Some of them I was, I've been, you know, Brian May is a very close friend of mine. Keith Emerson was an extremely close friend of mine. May he rest in peace. Greg Lake. Jimmy Page. J- Jimmy's a friend of mine. Right. You know, but, but I'm not, I'm not there to, to uh, I, I, I'm, this, you cannot have that sense of entitlement. Yeah, I got you. You know, you can't walk around like, oh, I got a 14 inch dick because I work for Led Zeppelin or anybody. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have to, and, and you got to blend in, and, man. And, and you know what? And the, the once or twice, I mean, you, you have a job to do. So that's number one is doing your job. There, there was a time um, in, uh, Let's see, because I don't think I wrote about this. I alluded to it in the book, but we were in Cleveland at Swingos, and uh, we we found out about uh, a, a press party that was going to happen the next night in Detroit for the band Little Feet. Now I knew Robert loved all that kind of music, so so Danny Marcus, a dear dear friend of mine. Hey Danny, how you doing? Uh, was the Atlantic Records. Um, Oh, uh, tour liaison guy. In other words, the guy with the Amex card. Right. And um, uh, Danny and myself and uh, the PR person, uh, the girl who was on the road with us doing PR, uh, decided to take Robert to Detroit a day. Or we were playing the Silverdome and three days later, but we decided it would be fun to just fly to Detroit and go to this little feet party so we'd be there earlier than the rest of the band and unfortunately 
none of us remembered to tell Richard Cole. Oh. So we get, to, you know, so the four of us just leave Swingos. We get to, we fly commercial to Detroit from Cleveland. Fly commercial. Yeah. And Robert and, Plant. Oh, awesome. Know, he's, he's, he's a dude who buys yeah. a plane ticket. Yeah. And, um, and we get to Detroit, and it's funny because we, we, I guess the, 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 the party was either the party was at the Troy Hilton and we ended up at the Detroit Hilton or the, or vice versa, but we never quite made it to the party. But so we're, so we're in Detroit, the rest of the band shows up, and the second uh, the entourage shows up, I get a call from Richard and he says, You got to go up to G's room right now. Oh, fuck. Right now. Because G needed to spank me. And, uh, and he was not pleased that we kidnapped his singer. Right. I mean, mid tour. Before probably the biggest Silver show of Dome. that leg. Yeah, Silver yeah. Dome. And, you know, where's Robert? Oh, yeah, he went with Neil and Danny and Janine to, to Detroit. Not a good idea. Oh, fuck. So, um, so and this was on a Saturday if I'm not mistaken, late afternoon. And I, Peter told me he was not happy with me. And I was told that I was to have six 11 by 14 prints of John Bonham slipped under John Bonham's hotel room door by 12 noon the next day. Or I'm gone. Really? So... What what was that about? Is that like a band meeting? And, and no, no, that was Peter spanking me. Oh wow! Teaching me a lesson. Wow! Knowing that it wasn't going to be easy. Right. So, uh, oh, so, what, so what did I do? Oh my! I I mean I had the negatives with yeah. me, but you know I've got nobody to print them. I don't. You know where do I get a dark room? You know I call, I called the guys at, at the local newspaper. Every guy that I knew in in Detroit, I know you know the Cream Magazine people. They had all been up the night before, all high on blow, and, and no one would. I couldn't even get half the people to return my calls. Someone with Cream Magazine finally got said that I could go in Sunday morning. They got me the keys to the office, and there was a dark room there. I hadn't mixed chemicals in years. Yeah, and the plane, the the sorry, taxi fare alone from where we were staying in Pontiac to Birmingham, Michigan, was in the hundreds of dollars. Oh, man. And anyway, <laughs> so I get there, and I probably hadn't slept that night either, just out of stress, if, if nothing else, if you know what I mean, wink, wink, wink. And, um, <laughs> and I get into this dark room, and I start mixing chemicals, and I don't know if anything's at the right temperature. And I mean, I had done a lot of dark room work in my life, but not for at least two or three years previous to that. And I got the prints made. I locked the office up. I got in a cab, you know, Pontiac, whatever hotel, you know, and step on it. Yeah. Just like in an old Cary Grant movie. Yeah. And I think I got the prints pushed under Bonzo's door by like two minutes to 12. Wow. I got it done. And that was Peter's way of reprimanding me. Holy shit. And I got it done. Was that the only time he ever fucked up? You could call it fucking up. I, you know, it was. Uh, it was the. I didn't follow protocol, apparently. Right, right. But I, I really wasn't thinking about it in that way. I mean, certainly I didn't mean to piss anybody off, and certainly if I thought it would have been an issue, it would have happened differently. But you know, we wanted to go to the little feet yeah, party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What can I say? I, I mean, you know, there's. Things happen on tours, but, uh, you know, in the days before, and I write about this, the days before everyone, their mother, had a camera in their pocket. Right. Uh, I was the one who, regardless of what tour I'm on, I was the one always asked to, hey, can you shoot my picture with so-and-so? Can you shoot my picture with so-and-so? And, and I would, and I would, and then promoters always want their pictures taken with, with the artist. Right. It's, it's very bizarre, but any promoter I've ever met around the world insists on getting their pictures taken with the artist. Yep. And, you know, I don't care if it's, if it's Pete Townsend or Celine Dion, you know, they want their pictures taken with the artist. So, and, and I would. 
and every night I would get back to my hotel room and I'd have a pocket full of these little notes that would say, you know, Janice, picture of me and so and so, heart, 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 hearts. Oh, you know, don't forget, here's my phone number. And I'd have dozens of these pieces of paper. Yeah. That, you know, what was I going to do? So I make, in my book, I make a blanket apology to anyone that I ever promised a print of, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to not send it, but I had really had a full plate, you guys, and I so I make a blanket apology. I'm sorry. Well, this ain't the old, the new days now, where you just go, hey, no, text no, me that no, photo. No, no, this of is course. like you're out on a major no, tour. And, and frankly, let, I, I don't remember. You yeah, know, I, let I, me get home and go to the dark room and then send these out or six even, months or even from a now. month later. You yeah, know, I, I mean, obviously the super important ones got done, but yeah, you know, you know, some some dude in omaha or you know yeah you can only do so much so um, as, yeah as far as led zeppelin working specifically with that band is concerned um they were tremendous to work with i mean they were gracious they um let me do what i do the way i do it um especially jimmy and robert and jonesy because i was closest with them um and uh you know i i got asked in an interview by someone last week was it as crazy as we've all heard and i said i looked at the guy and i said listen if you're using the word crazy as a metaphor for sex and drugs i will tell you that it was crazier with REO Speedwagon. Whoa, really? Absolutely. Whoa, Gary Richrath and the crew? Or, 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 or Cheap Trick. Oh, Cheap or, Trick? Or, or Heart, or any of them. You know, Crazier than Zeppelin? Cheap Trick? If you're using the word crazy... For drugs, a, yeah, I gotcha. I mean, look, everyone's heard the stories. Uh, you know, there there isn't one tour I've been on where I didn't see something go on that... I made the decision not not to photograph, but, right. but it's not about you know. I'm I'm proud that I was there to t to make good photographs. Right. And I think I made some very very good photographs. Oh hell yeah! And you that's did. and that's you know period. That's the end of that yeah. story. So, to wrap up Zeppelin before yeah, we yeah. go into some other bands, getting back to this aerial shot of yeah. Nebworth. This is what my uh, genius, the genius I think of Peter Grant is, and it always is. Yeah. He's, he was the first guy. I remember when when the band was coming over, they go, the promoter gets uh, yeah, ninety percent. Uh, Zeppelin gets ten. He goes, no, fuck you. You want Zeppelin? Someone gets a percentage it of whatever. It you flips know. the other way. Yeah, ninety yeah. Zeppelin, yeah. ten to the promoter. Well, that apparently, and I I don't know much about that end of the business, but right. that apparently changed a lot of the. Um, uh, the way bands got paid, on, the big bands anyway, got exactly. paid on tour. But 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 what I'm saying is the genius of him is this photo of Nebworth, and then I read what why he wanted you to take this. Yeah, and he said I'm having a guy come over pick these photos well, up, no well, questions well, asked. Well, I'll, I'll I'll tell the story. Yeah. Um, so we're at Nebworth uh, during the day, and uh, my friend Mitchell Fox, who worked at Swan Song runs over to me and says, do you have any problems going up in a helicopter? As I said before, I'm an aviation fanatic. I'll go up in anything that'll fly. So he said, okay, we need you to take some aerial photographs of the crowd. No problem. I'm a big show. I mean, I'd done it before. Yeah. I do it. I've done it since. Uh, so uh, we go out to the area that's the helipad, which was just a big grassy area. And uh, Chopper's coming in. It was Chopper Jimmy was on. Um, and he he gets off the plane, you know, as soon as the rotors stop. And they duck under the rotors. And he comes off. And I, I get on. And I have one cam. I think, I don't know if I had a bag, but I had like a, a one body with a couple of lenses. Um, and as if I recall correctly, there was no door yeah, uh, they either pulled the door off for me or like Vietnam loaded. style. Yeah, exactly. It was, and I'm held in by by uh, a, a seatbelt not much thicker than that charging cable for your iPhone. <laughs> but I have no problem with this. Yeah. So, and it was a Jet Ranger helicopter. So, 
uh, I, I asked, the, and I have the headphones on, and the pilot's got the phones on. I asked him to do a, a couple of 360s, and, and all I'm worried about is that one of my lenses is going to roll out and kill somebody. Yeah. I mean, a roll of film dropped from 3,000 feet can kill somebody. Yeah. Or certainly ruin their day. And uh, so did a couple of rolls of color, a couple of rolls of black and white, put them in my pocket, forgot about it. And then uh, after I got back to L.A., I got a call from someone else at the band's office in New York saying, uh, okay, there's, we need you to take the best you know, dozen photos or whatever. The original negatives, original transparencies. Someone will be showing up at your door tomorrow. To put them in an envelope, give them to this man, no questions asked, just give them to him. I'm not given a reason why. It's very James Bond esque. Right, you know. right. Sure enough, next day, knock, knock, knock. You know, hello, I'm here for the envelope, please. I give him the envelope, and that's the last I ever heard about it. I found out years later that uh, Peter was fairly certain that the promoter was going to bone him on the amount of tickets sold. Uh, they reported, I, I don't know, 100,000 plus or whatever, but there, there were, were clearly 150,000 or 140,000 people there. And Peter had, had, at that point, gained access to the software that had originally been developed for NASA, whereby you could, you could feed a negative in and the software would divide this crowd shot into quadrants and be able to uh, estimate the amount of people in each quadrant, plus or minus like 100 people. So that times four will give you the size of the crowd, plus or minus 400. Unbelievable. And he <clears throat> wanted that in his back pocket in the event that he had to sue the promoter. And he did have to sue the promoter, and he won the case. That's so fucking so I, great. So I, so I was the insurance policy. How incredible is it that Peter Grant's constantly looking for new things to help him against well, scammers? He, well, yeah, I mean, he's 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 not going to allow his band to get boned yeah. like that. So that and to me, that was that that was Peter Grant in a nutshell. Now. Uh, one of the most iconic things that you did shoot uh, was Live Aid. And, yeah, uh, I, I was the official American photographer at the British show. So the, the British show was, of course, Queen. And when well, you let's see. It was Paul, Paul McCartney, yep. Queen, Elton, The Who, uh, U2, a uh, bunch of other people. But the Freddie Mercury photo that you took... Is one of the most iconic Freddie photos of all time. Well, well, the one with Wembley in the background right. is not from Live Aid. Oh, that's from their that's own from show. That's from '86, gotcha. the next year. But the but there's one that I shot from the side of the stage, where you see Freddie and the and and the whole crowd. It's it's a very wide shot, and uh, I think they're in the middle of uh, Radio Gaga. Um, uh, I don't even know if that photo's in the book. Or not. I it think might it, be. it's on your. If you go to his webpage, PrestonPictures.com. It, uh, yeah, and we're gonna put some new photos in there. So yeah, yeah, there's some yeah. great fucking photos but, on but, here. But uh, you, you know, it, look, Live Aid. Yeah. Was a TV show. Right. And I had I was in England because uh, the uh, Bruce ended that leg of the Born in the USA tour in London, so. Uh, so I was already there, and then Live Aid came down the pike, and I decided that I'd stay in London for three weeks. Uh, you know, Ken Regan, who owned Camera 5, my picture agency, was one of the official photographers in Philly, and I was in London, so we had the whole thing covered. And uh, they had to drag me kicking and screaming out of the Mayfair Hotel. I, got, I fell in love with that place. But, um, uh, you know, that was... It was. It's a TV show. It's a media gangbang. But right before Queen went on, Jerry Stickles, who was the band's uh, tour manager, grabbed me and said, "You're coming on stage with us." Wow! And finally, and the, 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 that uh, those guys were family. The crew, the band, th that was family. I finally felt like I was at a rock show. 
during during Queen set. Wow. And 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 because you're you know, just floating around out well, there. Well, you know, I, but I'm more concerned the whole day with getting enough film shot to to fulfill the uh, magazine guarantees that we had all over the world. And but now I'm at a Queen show, and I felt home. Right. Uh, and, and of course in retrospect is now considered one of the greatest live performances if not the greatest in history i'm not i don't know if that's true or not but i know that they rehearsed a lot and they kicked ass big time yeah they, they did. were fantastic i was just on broadway you got your start your first photo was taken at broadway your dad worked in the theater doing lighting cues for fiddler on the roof and all and, this and, stuff and, uh, every pretty much every big musical in the heyday right 50s 60s 70s my dad was a production stage manager you grew up in the city i grew up in forest hills new york wow uh, home of the ramones who, who were awesome who, younger than me can't stand the ramones sorry oh. uh leslie leslie west yeah kiss sorry leslie weinstein i oh. should say kiss i used to buy hash from leslie's brother yeah, <laughs> larry really? weinstein wow yeah uh, gene and paul i think we're up, up the road in kew gardens and uh, Paul Simon and Artie Garfunkel went to my high school ten years before me. I think that my sister was was in, knew them was in their class, but uh, not a lot of uh, music people from Forest Hills. No, no. But my point is, I saw Bruce on Broadway last week, yeah. and you were on the Born to Run, uh, uh, Born in the USA tour, and the Amnesty tour, and right. the Tunnel of Love tour, and Tom Joad. Well, Tom Joad. My yeah. favorite. Yeah. But but my my thing is born in the USA is absolutely the the uh, the fucking massive massive well, Bruce. The picture of mine that Bruce used in his autobiography uh, which is Bruce with all of Wembley in the uh, stadium in the background. Yeah. And his caption that he wrote was the big 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 time. Yeah. <laughs> the and triple Br- big. And Bruce, you know, Here's the great thing about Bruce, and Bruce has been very, very good to me over the years, and Patty has, and thank you guys both. Really, I love you. Uh, but Bruce, Bruce is is very eloquent, and I found that out on the Amnesty tour when we went around the world, and we'd have these press conferences at, uh, before uh, before the show, wherever we were, be it Athens or. New Delhi or Tokyo or Abidjan, the Ivory Coast or Buenos Aires, you know, and and there's a picture in the book of Bruce sitting on the floor writing some notes out, and he was getting he was preparing some notes for one of the press conferences, and he's an incredibly bright and incredibly elegant, uh, eloquent, and elegant man. Yeah. That's even bigger than any kind of Zeppelin by, by then, right? I mean, yeah, the yeah. lunacy of it, you know? It's just, well, it wasn't so much lunacy as it was a behemoth right. of a tour. I mean, if if you think about the Amnesty tour, what, four years later, which was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we had been on the Tunnel of Love tour, and then Bruce decided to uh, to go on the Amnesty tour around the world and we had we had two airplanes uh two dc-10s that flew us around the world one was everything was pulled out of it so that was for all the band every band's equipment right you know pas whatever amps everything because we had bruce and peter gabriel and sting tracy chapman uh um and Yusu Endur, I think that's the proper way to pronounce his name. And then the other plane was configured, was DC-10, configured 100% in, in coach. Wow. Oh, in coach. Yeah. So, Whoa, so it, they can it, fit everyone? Yeah. So Ooh. it's not... Uh, comfortable. It's not, no, it's not comfortable. And, and once we're out of the States, you know, Oakland to Tokyo, Tokyo to New Delhi... New Delhi to Athens. Oh, my God. Athens. It's funny I remember this. Athens to Zimbabwe. They're long flights. Yeah. They're seven, eight hours, six, you know, and it's tiring. Yeah, in coach. In coach. And, and you're in every town for three days. I mean, you don't, you know, you see stuff. 
you're somewhere, but you don't get to sightsee. I mean, I was on the Great Wall of China for a half an hour with Wham. Wow. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's a picture in there of, of George and Andrew and some little Chinese kid. I love, I love some of these Bruce photos, man, because it's like, you know, they're such incredible pieces of history because that... Bruce absolutely it become this is great. Is this Philadelphia? Yeah, that's from the streets of Philadelphia uh, video music, shoot. Video shoot, yeah. Wow. So once you're working for Bruce, is he just always calling you as his official guy? Uh, well, we went through a period where I was doing a ton of work for him. Wow. Uh, and I I did two of Patty's album covers as well. Do you do you still work for him at all? I haven't worked with him for a while, but uh, you know if I would see him walking down the street. You know, the second I leave here, it would be great. You know, yeah, we'd be like two high school girls that hadn't seen each other in a while. You know, I mean, Bruce, Bruce was living out here for yeah, a long time. That's right, with that other so, woman. Yeah, yeah, you know, I was, I was the go-to guy a lot, and uh, you know, I, Bruce has been very, very good to me. It really has. And uh, your photo is the cover of that live set. The yeah. The, yeah, yeah the box set. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Someone told me he looks like a soldier yeah. uh, marching on. It really does feel like that, like he's out there in yeah. battle. Like, also, uh, you know, nothing that's going to win a Grammy here, ladies and gentlemen. But I think I have the cover of the um, of the uh, unplugged or plugged, whatever it was. Oh yeah, that's right. That's a great yeah. one. And uh, it's an interesting story that I was called to see about doing the 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 shoots for the covers of human touch and lucky town. And I had already taken another job to shoot John Lee hooker. Oh, wow. So I couldn't do th those other shoots. For oh Bruce. my I God. Mean, you know, it's one of those things, but I'm, I'm not a guy that, that takes one job and then it's, it's like having a date with a girl, but then a hot, hotter blonde calls you and yeah. Yeah. You know, and you blow off the other girl. I, th that's live aid right there. Yeah. You know, so, and I don't believe in that. Yeah, you don't want to do that because it's like you've you've uh, you know, you've said you yes to, be to a someone. Man of your word. You yeah, know, you, you don't know. want to be jumping around. No, and uh, I mean, fuck, you've shot everyone. How about this Axl Rose photo here? This was Rolling Stone magazine, right? Uh, the I'm cover. Not sure. Uh, no, no. No. No, that was shot for people. Shot for people. Yeah, and and it was funny because uh, Axl was at the time married to Aaron Everly. Right. right? And was living in, a, in an apartment building. Behind right, Tower? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Well, Sunset and Doheny. Right. right oh, there. yeah, right there. And, uh, you know, I had heard some stories about, oh, what moods he going to be in. I never met him. And he was great. He, he, he couldn't, couldn't have been nicer. And at the end of the shoot with, with him and Aaron, Aaron I, I said, uh, what are you doing later? He said, well, I'm going to the record plant. Where, I, I forget what record. The Illusion Records. One of them. 1990, you know? yeah. And uh, I said, do you mind if I tag along and shoot some stuff in the studio? And he said, sure, come on down. That's where I shot that. And and I, I wrote a thing in the book about recording studios and how, to me, they're, they're sacred, sacred places. And almost, I get this feeling like I shouldn't even be there because it's where those people make their magic. Right. And my favorite photos... Uh, from any photographer are one shot in recording studio. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the the people that I grew up idolizing, like Garrett Mankiewicz, uh, David Bailey, of course, uh, Stephen Paley. Stephen Paley has these killer photographs of uh, that he shot of like uh, Aretha and Dwayne Allman, you know, in, at Muscle Shoals, and you know, those are. I love recording studio pictures. Yeah, yeah. I, I almost, I, I feel like I shouldn't be in there, though. Yeah. Know? What about this Michael Jackson, Freddie Mercury that, photo? That's just very simply, you know, uh, people would come down and visit the band uh, if we were in New York or L.A., you know, different celebrities. I remember Olivia coming down, Donna Summer coming down once, you know, whomever, and... And that was just a, you know, Michael showed up with some of his brothers and, and there's nothing else to say, you know, I mean, it's just a moment and I happen to be there to capture it. That's so rad, man. I mean, this book is incredible. It's now, is it out right now? It's, uh, you know what the release date? Well, it is available for pre-sale on Amazon. Right. Uh, 
And the title is Neil Preston, Exhilarated and Exhausted. It's unbelievable, which, this which, book. The, if I can tell the story about how I came up with the title. Absolutely. Um, I was sitting one night and, I, you know, I wanted to, I want this book. And I, I, I conceived this book of, as something that would be experiential in nature. Uh, I wanted to be able to have the reader get as close as possible to the feeling of being on the road with a big rock band, right. be it Zeppelin or the Who or whomever. It's like the almost famous book, because that if, felt if, so if, fucking if you real, will, if you will. Right. But and and but this is not a movie. This is real I get life. It, you but know? I'm just saying, you and, know what um, I mean? And, that and, felt and, like what and, it would be like on and the road. You know that I was, well, almost famous is a whole other story here. Yeah. But but I wanted. Uh, for for all of you guys that ever wanted to know what it's like being on the road with Led Zeppelin, what it's like being on the road with any of them, I wanted this book to be able to convey in words and text. And and I wrote everything, and I wrote it with my very snarky sense of humor, and I wrote it very conversationally and about the stuff that I have to go through doing my job on the road. And I thought... I want the reader at the end of the book to feel exhilarated and exhausted because that's the way I feel every day of my life. And, and it kind of hit me. Is, is that my title? Is that a great title? And I kind of slept on it a day or two and I called Cameron and I said, what do you think of this title? Am I out of my mind or is it great? And he said, it's fucking great. So I kept it. It is and, great. And, and I think it describes exactly you know it's exactly what i was trying to convey yeah you know the exhilaration of doing what i do and the exhaustion look because how long you and cam and crow have been friends isn't that amazing you together. shot on his films uh, yeah well starting with almost famous um i did all the stills on almost famous and that was surreal because there i am with my best friend directing that alone is insane yeah and he's directing people um in scenes that i was around i was staying next to him for the real stuff that happened i mean the the the, the guy that uh in the movie the kid chases uh the lead guitar player around for the key interview in real life it was greg allman right and uh and i was right next to cameron you know for everything with greg and 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 but you know everything in a movie is real and as it, it felt really so real. well it, it truly is yeah. and um uh to, to the layers of uh, surrealness i don't know what the word is were, were just one after the other after the other and and to me it felt work on that movie for whatever it was three four months it felt like being on tour right not working on a movie and to this day if i were to run into billy crudup or jason lee or any of the guys in the band to me, they're the guys in Stillwater. Yeah. They aren't four actors. Yeah, Fever Dog's a real song to me. You know you what know, I mean? They're the guys in Stillwater. Yeah. In fact, I wanted to slip a Stillwater photo in, there? in here, but it, it just didn't quite work. But I have an idea for something uh, next year. And, and uh, you know, I want to slip a photo of Kate as Penny Lane. And, and you know, I, I know the real Penny Lane. That's rad, man. That's right. So uh, almost famous was was a joy, and it, you remember and, shooting uh, the Marin scenes? Lock the gates! Oh yeah, because that character was based on a certain promoter I know, and uh, yeah, we me and Mark talked about that scene. Um, he I, he told me he only worked one night. I thought it was two. Right. But when he and I don't know if you've seen the director's cut. Yeah, I have. Yeah, because the director's cut has twenty extra minutes, and it's fucking hysterical yeah there's that crazy there's shit the at the scene, radio station the and the stuff radio st yeah. station where the where the the dj falls asleep in the middle of smoking a joint i love that and and the band starts taking the piss out of him by saying feces yeah yeah like that. yeah and it's i'll tell you what and i i will admit to this i did ruin a take because i laughed out loud it was so funny <laughs> and i'm very careful about that on a set whether it's cameron set or anyone else's set you can't be that guy who ruins a fucking take because right. you're laughing out loud. But it was so funny. Yeah. You know, it, it's how could you not? You ever shoot any comedians? 
Who'd you shoot back in the day? Like yeah. Belushi, uh, you know, uh, okay. Pryor? Well, you know, I, there was a, when they used to do those comic relief shows. Oh, yeah, HBO, yeah, those, yeah. Probably shot five or six of those. Oh, so they used to do stuff up in, in Aspen for HBO. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've shot, uh, I'd have to think of the one on one shoes, but I had yeah, a People yeah. Magazine contract for 20 years. That's great. Did you do the Zeppelin cover in 80? No, that was, uh, no, it wasn't 80, it was 70. Six. Seven. That oh, that's right. Yeah. Co rent meester. God, that's such a weird photo because yeah. I recently uh, found that online yeah. and then I was like, oh, and then I, I grabbed it off of eBay. Yeah. It's such a bizarre thing. Yeah. To see. Well, they clearly weren't comfortable. Yeah. Right. It, but, uh, you know, look, I've done a lot of people covers and not everyone's comfortable doing them, right. regardless of who they are. I Be mean, I've done covers of, oh, Jesus. Yeah. I mean, where do I start? Uh, Tom and Roseanne, uh, Nancy Kerrigan. You know, I was with Nancy Kerrigan all through that whole thing of her getting the '84 Olympics. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, I was with her when she went to the doctor. When she, I, I photographed her having her MRI, going into the tube, and then uh, the next day when I went with her to the doctor and look, when she looked at the X-rays to find out if she would ever walk again properly, much less skate again. Yeah. Can you believe that fucking happened, man? That is so crazy. People are, people are nuts, man. Yeah. You know, people are crazy, but uh, I, I, in my capacity as a people, well, I can't say staffer because I was, but I, I had a contract with them, and it was a, basically a guarantee for X amount of shoot days per year. And it could be 30, 40. At one point, it was like 70 shoot days a year. 70 so covers. I have 700 shoot days under my belt. For wow. That does include travel days, but still, I've shot six Olympic games for them. Wow. And, uh, you know, I had to pick up a couple of days here and there from Time or Sports Illustrated. But um, I, love, I love shooting sports. And uh, one of the first things I ever did was for Rolling Stone in 77, when the Dodgers were in the World Series against the Yankees, they found out that Lindo was going to be singing the national anthem yeah. at Dodger Stadium. So Rolling Stone got me a World Series credential for the 77 series. And in those days, it was just a thing where it was like at a deli when you buy a sandwich and they punch out yeah. a number. And when they punch 10, you get a free corned beef sandwich. Yeah. Know? But uh, <laughs> But I realized that you know, I went and shot Linda singing the national anthem. Those are those famous pictures of her in the Dodger jacket. Oh, Linda Ronstadt. Yeah, and she looks Rad. fantastic. So, uh, but I realized that the credentials were good for every every, every game? game. Oh shit! So every game at Dodger Stadium, uh, I I shot, and I I was sorry to say because I'm a huge Dodger fan, and I do not like the Yankees. But I was in the Yankees locker room as they when they celebrated winning the World Series in L.A. and I got beer all over my camera because Reggie Jackson doused me. Wow. You know, so those are the kind of things. Uh, Michelle Kwan's been a friend of mine for years and years. And uh, a lot of what I'd shoot for People Magazine at the Winter Olympics would be figure skating. And, and, and the, you know, and the guy skaters are unbelievably talented. I oh, mean, that stuff's you, radical, you know, dude. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, come on. I mean, ice skaters are some of the most amazing athletes that you will ever see in your life the men and the women yeah I mean, they're just it's astounding and i've and i've watched michelle practice day after day and i've watched brian boitano practice and philippe candelero and you know many of them scott hamilton and it's just it's it's wild you know they're rock stars in their own world. Absolutely. I mean that's a physical rock star, you know, yeah. like uh yeah. physically. What's the scene before we get out of here be behind this kiss snow photo? I remember well, uh, this. I remember this when this came out. Well, did did you read the piece? I didn't read this okay, one. Well, no. well I'll, I'll tell you. I'll yeah. tell you all about it. Unbelievable. This was it was shot. Uh, we need to do a cover for Cream magazine. And right. It was supposed to be a Christmas cover, a holiday cover, and. Um, of course, we shot it in September, I think, yeah, because of lead time. And uh, I had a, um, at the time, I was just coming off a retainer deal with the A and M Records, and we shot on the weekend, and and they let us into the A and M photo studio. Yeah. Uh, so 
the idea was I wanted to make it a little cheese ball. So we rented a, a, a backing, which is, is a backdrop in the movie business. They're called backings. But I went through all these books and I found this winter kind of foresty, looked like Vermont or something. Right. Uh, yeah. Background. Tr- yeah. And then we bought cartons of this of this fake movie snow. Right. And spread it all around. And I had two guys in the rafters with little bits of it that could give me a little Sprinkle flurries. You know, so we had instant winter in the photo studio. Um, and the band shows up and Ace, you know, Gene comes in and Paul comes in. I had known the, those guys. And, and uh, Ace came in and had started partying a bit earlier. And, and what year the, is this? 80, 79? No, no, it's 70. I think we shot it in 76. Oh, wow. Okay. 76. Gotcha. Because for a December cover. Right. And um, in the middle of the shoot, and this is polyurethane snow. Right. Highly toxic. Right. I don't even think they make it anymore. And I, at one point, and we're shooting and everything's going okay, and I, I go in the other room to switch lenses or something, and I hear thud, and I run out, and Ace has just done one of these boom face down yeah. into the fake snow and then taking a big whiff of it and started coughing up blood and Whoa. it's because it's like i said highly toxic so, so and end of shoot end of shoot. end of shoot that's a wrap ladies and gentlemen and uh did they rush him to the hospital well, or something I, someone <laughs> said i remember someone and i don't recall who saying maybe we should call 911 I don't know if it was me or my partner or Gene or whomever. Yeah. But by the time we realized there was a problem, they had already gotten Ace into a car and driven him off. So I assume. Whenever I see this, like this kind of photos behind the scenes of Ace, you realize year after year after year when people go, when is Ace getting in the band? It's so. They put up with so much all those years to keep it going. Well, you know, Gene and Paul don't do any of that. Yeah, right. Stuff. And I remember asking Paul once, because I was very interested in this. I said, I said, now, I know that you are sober as sober can be. I asked, I said, how aware are you of what's going on in the audience and around you? And he said, I'm aware of everything, absolutely everything. So I and I asked him. I said, "So if there's a a, a hot redhead in the thirtieth row, you've already scoped her out." Yeah, yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if 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 I've dropped, if you happen to be looking my direction, I've dropped three rolls of film. You know, he said, "Yeah, yeah." And uh, you know, and every question, you know, point is hypersensitive, hyper aware. And look, they're not my favorite band in the world, but good at what they do. And, yeah, and um, and I really, I really love that from Paul because he, you know, that's a different mindset. Yeah, but you know what? Whatever your band is, whatever your mindset is, you're you're there to do a job. Pete Townsend being the the ultimate, and I could go, I could do a whole show about Pete, who's my idol of idols, but. As he likes to say, I'm there to do my job and I fucking do it well. Right. You know. Yeah. And and, uh, and he does to this day. Um, and I love shooting the Who. It, 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 we were when we were in um, it either had to be Birmingham or Manchester on Bruce's tour, and Pete showed up at one of the shows. And oh no, it was Slain. It was Slain Castle. Yeah. Uh, which uh, is is. Uh, outside of dublin and the 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 guy the the the, whatever he is the prince or the 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 royal guy i don't know any of their names who who owns the castle has has a deal with the council where it's this castle that's on a hill and there's a huge almost woodstock-esque max yasger-esque uh farm or, or or just big open field and one day a year, he is allowed to put on a rock show. Wow! And it's and he always tries to get the biggest band in the world that year. And I've been to Slain twice: once with Bruce and once with Queen. But I remember Pete being uh, coming to Slain, and the the night before the show, uh, 
Bruce and the band rehearsed inside the castle, and then there was this dinner, and and uh, you know I don't know how many a dozen round, big round tables are set up, and and we're all sitting and eating, and and it's not loud, you know. It's a, we're in a castle, right? Right. And I, I think I might have been sitting, I, I don't remember, next to Patty or someone with the band, but all of a sudden, out of the blue, we hear someone stand up and yell you fucking silly cow and it was pete whoa who stood up and threw a drink in some chick's face whoa and stormed off to the kitchen to like go downstairs and eat with the help whoa it was fantastic just out of nowhere yeah, rock I mean, style you silly fucking cow <laughs> and uh i will never forget that and i we, everyone at the table looked at each other that was Pete. Ooh. Oh, yeah, it was Pete. Wow. Because, you know, when you go see The Who, you want them as angry as possible. Oh, totally, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a direct proportion, the, the anger level of the band and the, the quality of the set, you know. And I don't know what got him going, but it's, it's just a, like a stupid, funny little story, but I will never forget it. And, and mind you, he could sing the Yellow Pages, and I'll be entranced. Yeah, man, that's fucking great. Well, thanks for doing the show. No problem. You're still shooting, right? I'm still shooting, baby. Will you go out on uh, tour with any bands? Uh, well, I've been working with Queen on and off, the, you know, with for Adam. that For the movie? Yeah. No, 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 no. They're shooting that in England. Right. Uh, but we went down to Rio a couple of years ago um, and uh, did some other Adam stuff. Lambert, Queen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Adam That's some good shit, job. man, right? Adam does a really great job. He's, he, he attacks... He attacks it with a vengeance that's right. all its own, and he's he's not Fred. He's not trying to be Fred, but he's Adam, and and he does a great job, and I'm very proud of him. And you know that's that's you're not going to fill those shoes, but he you, says it right in the but show. You bring another pair of shoes yeah. to the table. You know? Yeah, he goes look. When I got the call to do it, uh, they're like, uh, you can't fill Freddie's shoes. He's like, no fucking shit, so you idiot. So don't try. Yeah, don't try. Don't try. And I mean, Freddie's one of the biggest of all right. time. And you know what? And I think Freddie, for whatever reason, is more famous than ever now. It's crazy, right? Yeah. And, and Adam does a spectacular job. He really, really does. Yeah. He's got a vocal range to, to, to die for, for, you know. And uh, so... Yeah, so we've been doing stuff uh, that I worked on roadies last year. Oh yeah, Cameron's with Cameron TV show, and hopefully we have something big uh, for next year. Um, A new I, show or something on the on the download. Got you. I'm not gonna say <coughs> right. Um, and uh, I did do. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna say what I last did. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You, you, you know, non-disclosure forms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you off the record when we turn. Yeah, the I mean, it's not that big a deal. But um, but right now it's about the book. And, it is the book, and, and it's bringing a, it to the people, and and get out there you know, and get and this the challenge book. Is when you see this book, whomever you are out there, yeah. read three or four pages, and you'll be hooked because it was written with the fan in mind. I fucking love this book, man. This Neil Young photo from the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young yeah, tour. Neil yeah. Young just looking so incredible. Look at these Mesa and, boogie and, yeah, amps. And they're both standing. Uh, yeah. Him and David are both standing in the same place. It's insane. And, some some of this Eagles stuff, man. This Eagles from, what is this, the Hotel California? No, no, oh, that's, 75. That's one of these nights. Oh, one yeah. of these nights. I mean, well, yeah. dude, this photo. Who's it? It's Jeff Beck, Jeff. right? It's Jeff and Robert yeah. coming in backstage at the Singer Bowl. And then did you shot um, uh, Frampton at Day on the Green? Yep. God, man, that's the you know the big D. Yeah, like that I, was yeah, that's peak. I mean, look at this. That's this what I'm I can at. look at this book over and over and over. See now, as Br Brian calls Brian May calls yeah. this a very intimate moment on a Queen show because. I'm right next to Roger's drum riser right. in the back of the amps, and I know that the flash pots are going to go off. Yep. So I want to get that shot. You can see Fred over here. In the red leather pants, right. so dope. But I know that they're going to go off, and as Brian has said, you, we never knew how big those explosions were going to be. It's neither different. He said, well, because it depends how much powder is packed in there. Right, the right, right. But I've had, I had a roadie 
pretty much saved my life. And if not my life, definitely my nuts. Whoa. Because if you're standing in the wrong place and those things go off, it's not going to be a good day. Not at all. And uh, You shot the wall tour. No, I did. Uh, that's a dress rehearsal. A dress rehearsal yeah. for the wall in L.A. at the yeah. sports arena. Yeah, there you go. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm so I'm honored that you're that you're so effusive in your praise. Oh, dude, I love you. I mean, my life is rock photos. There's not one in here because I moved here like a year ago and haven't yeah, I done, noticed. I haven't done. Ladies it. and gentlemen, his walls are bare. Yeah, I have to tell you. Yeah, I'm one of those guys that it's like I look around and go, "All right, I'm going to make a project." I, I've com- come to the conclusion that. I want to have the whole house rock photos, you know, like a museum. So when people are in right, here, they right, could be like, right. whoa, what's that? I go, oh, well, I had Neil Preston right. on. And well, that's, well, you, know. you know what? I, I have a, a huge collection uh, of, of photos of not mine, of, of people whose stuff that I love. Uh, and I have, well, I, I'm not into jazz. I admit it. But right. I, I have a Herman Len- Leonard photo of Miles Davis. Wow. There's five of them in the world at this size. This is the most stunning photograph ever. That's the shit, I've man. Got, uh, Ethan Russell gave me an enlarged proof sheet of a black and white roll that's an outtake from the Who's Next album shoot. Wow. That I, I didn't even know he shot black and white that day. Those are two of my prized possession, along with my main prized possession, which is... An 11 by 14 of John Lennon and Paul McCartney shot by David Bailey. Shit. Who is the guy, the king of the swing in London photographers and the guy that the main character from the movie Blow Up is based on. Right. And it's... And also the reason you shoot is because you saw the Beatles, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, the Beatles started everything for me. And, and, uh, you know, you know, David Bailey, like I said, Garrett Mankiewicz, who shot the famous Yardbirds photo with the five of them staying there, but you see the guy in the bowler cap through, uh, not Jimmy's legs, but, you know, the, Stephen Paley, the, these these are the, the masters. The masters. And yeah. you. You, dude. I, I don't, you know. It's uh, Of course, you're not going to say it, but to no, me, well, you know, I look at I've, some I've of these. I've got the original Robert Freeman's uh, uh, rubbers. The ru- I've got a sepia rubber, rubber sole cover. I still uh, crack up because... You and and everybody from your day shot film. It was so fucking much harder. You had to have film on well, you. You, know you had what? to get it developed. You had to fucking. So you had to get it developed. It's all part of the deal. Yeah. The, the last, the newest photo in here is the photo I shot of Courtney. Right. We Courtney shot in uh, February or something like that. And I shot that on film. Wow. You still shooting film? Of course I still shoot film. That's I mean, great. unless the job dictates otherwise, and it's usually deadline considerations. I love that. I love this. But given my druthers, Will Bears. Yeah, this is great. Is, where is this at? San yeah. Diego? No, 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 no. That's Wembley. That's a oh, Wembley. That's right after Live Aid. The oh. Live Aid show in it. That's just a lot of garbage. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I that's love what it. those shows were like, baby. All right. Well, thanks, man. And you got a website, Anytime. which I said it's uh, yeah, Preston's yeah, Preston, Pictures. Pre- no, www.prestonpictures.com. And you sell prints, right? We do. There's a, there is a Facebook page, Neil Preston Photography. And uh, we're doing a book signing at Rizzoli's in New York. When's that? On October 26th. Oh, yeah. We're Go doing to that, a book people. signing here in L.A. Oh, when's that? At book soup on november 3rd oh i'll come 7 p.m i'll come be there yeah and uh you know bring your friends open to the public and you know uh cameron's coming to the one in new york at rizzoli's so wow he's gonna be interviewing me live in front is of he him. living in new york or C- no, seattle he he oh he lives here. in la yeah yeah god i've been trying to get him on the show for 10 years write him yeah. a note i'll give him to i'm gonna see him in three hours <laughs> really oh, yeah hey, will you pass on my info for him yep I, I want to have him on because uh, I think Almost Famous is the ultimate rock and roll film. I played music all my life, 25 years, and the entire time I watched the movie, I kept saying, they're going to take a wrong turn, they're going to take a wrong turn, and they never took a wrong turn. And also, the reason I'm alive is rock and roll, but also probably Fast Times at Ridgemont well, High, which is the uh, all-time look, best film we, ever. We were roommates when Cameron uh, was writing Fast Times, and he was down in San Diego a lot of the time, and we had a house up on Pacific View Trail for six years together. Wow. But I remember when he 
brought the book home and not the galleys, but the first copy of the book. Yeah. Like this is the first copy. After sneaking into the school. and And I took it in my bedroom and I read it. And I laughed out loud at every page. The book is hysterical. God. And you know what? He, yes, he's my brother, and I love him very much. He is a brilliant writer. Oh, my Absolutely God. Absolutely brilliant. He is great, brilliant man. Writer. I got to have him on. A brilliant director, and, and, and every time I watch him do what he does, I'm blown away. So uh, you, that, I'll, I'll pass it on. That'd be amazing. Thank All you right. so much, man. And, 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 and congrats on this book. I fucking love it. Thanks. And uh, I'm looking forward to having one of your photos in my house one day. Oh, well, we'll see like, what we can do. Yeah. You know, you know uh, remember the part we talked about offering people to take me backstage? Yeah, backstage. dude. I'll, I'll give mean, you a quick hand job. Oh, Let me get no, a photo. Thank you. No, thank you. I want to go on record as saying no, thank you. Okay. Right. Thanks, everybody. See ya.